Hi, welcome to A History of Ancient Philosophy. I'm Mark Thorsby, and in this video we'll be discussing Aristotle's metaphysics. In particular, we'll be looking at excerpts from Book 8 and Book 12 of his text. Um, again, for those of you who want to follow along, um, right here I've included the general pagination, the universal pagination, and we're actually using this book today. The Ancient Greek uh, Readings in Ancient Greek Philosophy from Thales to Aristotle, published by Hackett. So welcome everyone. I hope you guys are doing well. This, of course, is going to complete our discussion on Aristotle's metaphysics. We should state from the beginning here that as a history of philosophy course, we're not going to, it's not, there's a lot more to talk about in terms of Aristotle's theory of substance and in his metaphysics. For instance, I encourage you to take a look at this book by Michael um, Wedden or Vedden which is on Aristotle's theory of substance. And there's other interesting books that are worth taking a look at. So um, there's a lot more here than we're going to be covering. But we will be taking a look today primarily at his conception of the unmoved mover in his sort of final analysis regarding potentiality and actuality of substances. So welcome aboard, everyone. It's good to have you. So let me sort of start off here just with sort of general um, terminology. Um, Aristotle's theory of substance here is known as holomorphic substance. Um, here's the sort of Greek term where we get the term of hylo from. Um, and hylo means something like matter. I think, in fact, in Greek it originally meant wood, but it means something like matter. And morph, morphe, this is the term that Aristotle is using when he talks about form. Um, so you can see it's different than the conception of eidos that we have in Plato. In fact, the term eidos for Aristotle is actually used um, for what we're looking at in his, in his term species. You'll remember that the species of a category is primary substance. And so, um, and the form here concerns the morphe. And this will be important because you're going to see here that Aristotle wants to develop a theory of being that can actually um, uh, take account of the idea that things are in a process and in a state of change and in a state of becoming. This, of course, is not a new conception. We saw this when we looked at Aristotle, when we looked at Plato, as well as some of the earlier pre-Socratics. But you're going to see here that none of those other thinkers, at least as far as Aristotle is concerned, really answers the question of what initiates um, a process and change in the beginning. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. And we're going to see here that it's he has a, his theory of substance, his theory of being here is holomorphic because he thinks that every being is composed of matter and form. Now we've discussed this previously. What we're going to see in today's discussion is Aristotle is now going to link up the discussion of matter with potentiality and the discussion of form with actuality. And by making this sort of categorical leap forward, Aristotle hopes to offer um, a solution to the problem that actually will begin to um, answer some of these questions once and for all. So the beginning of book eight here, Aristotle begins by sort of doing a kind of review. And I thought it would be good for us just to take a look at that review. I'll switch now to sort of my um, highlighted text here that I'll be using throughout the video. Um, to sort of show what Aristotle is writing about. Uh, but let's sort of review. Aristotle gives seven, let me see if I can get them in the video screen here. Aristotle gives seven primary category, primary remarks regarding what uh, we've looked at. So this is sort of good reminder. The first sort of thing here is to note that we're searching in metaphysics for the causes, the principles, and the elements of substances. Right? What we want to understand in metaphysics for Aristotle here is we want an answer to the question of what is it, how is it such the case, and what does it mean to say that something has being? Um, and being here is meant in its most univocal and general sense. Um, how are we to understand this? Um, and of course, he wants a universal explanation for being about the substances, the, the causes, the principles, and elements. But we have to consider the fact that every being is only known as a particular. That is, you can only experience things in their particular manifestation of being. Sometimes philosophers refer to this as the imminence of being. Um, the fact that a being has a sort of this quality, this being, rather than, you know, cups or something like this. Um, and again, this is a review from previous uh, videos as well. 
Number two, some substances are agreed by everyone to be substances. Now, this is important. That is, for the most part, there is general agreement about a certain category of things that we think of as beings, right? He says the agreed substances are the natural ones. For instance, fire, earth, water, air. And there, of course, he's talking, he's referencing the ancient Greek elements. Now, we don't have to reference the ancient Greek elements. It's clear to us that this is those elements are not true, but we do, in fact, have elements. Think of the periodic table of elements. So we all agree that the periodic table of elements, for instance, to sort of update Aristotle here, we all agree that these things have reality. They have being. Um, Right, and then the the plants and their parts, animals and their parts, and finally the heaven and its parts, right? So we agree about a whole bunch of things in nature as well regarding um, what has being. He says in some people's distinctive views, forms and mathematical objects or substances. And of course, here he's clearly making a reference to Plato and Plato's divided lines. So take a look at that if you haven't already. Um, and he said, and he's, you're going to see in this video that he's not, or in this, in this section here that we're looking at, he's not going to address the question of the mathematical objects and substances. He's just going to begin by taking a look at what we actually do agree on. And we agree that these things out here in nature, that they're real somehow, and meant that they have substance. Number three, some arguments imply that the essence is substance. Now, you'll recall in the, in the last video we looked at, we looked at the sort of instability in Aristotle's discussion. We saw that on the one hand, Aristotle seems to imply that substance is essence, but then on the other hand, the thisness quality, right, seems to defy that idea, right? So some arguments imply that the essence is substance, others that the subject is substance. Um, and we're going to talk about what the subject means here in just a minute. Other arguments imply that the genus is the substance more than the species are, and that the universal substance is more than the particulars are. And so you can see here, it looks like from all of these different angles Aristotle has been taking, we have a whole bunch of different uh, conclusions. How do we make these things clear? Now, one of the things you'll see in this text is Aristotle is going to use the term puzzle. He's going to say that, uh, we have to um, disentangle this puzzle. And the term in Greek there is actually aporia. And an aporia is something like a knot, like a, a knot that's all knotted together. And you can think about, I always think about my iPhone earbuds, right? Those things are horrible. Every time I put them, nicely wind them up, next time I pick them up, there's just a tangle, a mess. And you're going to see here that Aristotle is actually saying that in metaphysics, we're faced with the tangle of theoretical positions and a tangle of ideas and propositions and our task is going to be see if we can unsort and disentangle them and that's precisely what he's going to do in this in our discussion today in this book as well as in book 12. Um, so next so we and we had this distinction that remember if you'll recall that um, we only define things in terms of their universal but the substance cannot be the universal. The substance has to be the particular. So the substance can't be the genus. It has to be the species, um, as it were. Um, and so we have to sort of figure this stuff out. Number four, since the essence is substance, right, and a definition is an account of the essence, we have discussed definition and what is in its own right. And you'll recall that Aristotle talks about the idea of definitions have parts, and how do the parts define the whole, and there was this interesting discussion. We're going to see Aristotle in this video, or in this sub, this section, add one more new conception of definition, and he's going to argue that definition has to be something that's united, right? Um, something that's a unity. So a definition resembles the unity of a substance, not simply an amalgamation of its parts. Um, further, um, Let's see, or let's continue number five. Since a definition is an account and an account has its parts, which is what we talked about last time, right? We also had to consider what a part is to see what sorts of parts are parts of the substance and what sorts are not, and whether the same parts that are parts of the substance are also part of the definition. And here we're sort of, we might say that they we're asking the question of whether or not our language up here ultimately matches our reality, whether or not the definitions we give for the substances are actually in the substances, right? And whether or not the, the parts of substances themselves are in the definition. So there's a question here about the stability of our, of our ability to actually 
um, articulate definitions for types of substances. Now remember, even though we're using this fairly abstract language here, anything is a substance. So for instance, take this little Greek dictionary. This dictionary is a substance, right? And we could define it in terms of its being a book. Now you can see there a book is a universal essence of some sort, but this thing is not just universal, but somehow it does participate, to use that platonic language, with the universal. And so we have to figure out how this all works together. Further though, the universal nor the genus is the substance. We mentioned that just now, right? So it can't be that. And then number seven, we should examine ideas and mathematical objects later, since some of these are the substances uh, apart from perceptible substances. We're not going to talk about that in this video, so I encourage you to do that. Take a look at that in your own research. So he says, really, and for we're going to see for the excerpt we're looking at, let's proceed with the discussion of the agreed upon substances. That is things which are natural. Now, I want to pull your attention here to this quick passage here, and I didn't highlight anything, but it's really sort of, it really sort of is a cru crucial or I don't know crucial, but it's important for developing and setting up his argument, you'll see. He says, the subject is substance. In one way, matter is a subject. By matter, I mean what is potentially but not actually a this, right? So remember, if we disentangle, every substance has both form and matter. So this book has form, has a specific shape, but it also has matter. But matter by itself, right, matter without any form, is something that doesn't exist in our perception. It doesn't exist in experience because everything we perceive already has a form. So that means that to talk about matter itself is to talk about what is potentially the case, right? And here you can think about, just think about the atoms and the elements, right? This thing is composed of, you know, uh, some combination of elements that are on the periodic table. Right, but the but those elements by and of the, by themselves, right, actually consist what what could be the case, but never what is the case for any particular substance. Or I, that's confusing, I think. Right, the the elements themselves represent a potential for becoming anything. Right, and so there's this no this linkage between potentiality and substance. Right. In another way, the account of the form, right, that is that the definition we might give of, of what a book is or a dictionary is, right, um, the account of the form which a being a this is separable in the account, right, and, and here it's, we're emphasizing the this, the imminent quality of the being. Only it comes to be and perishes and is separable without qualification. For among substances, the correspondent the same account are separable without qualification and some are not. Um, so that's sort of important. He's just sort of laying out some of the basic ideas, right? Um, one thing here I'll mention too is he does mention this. He says that coming to be and perishing imply all other sorts of change. Um, so remember, when we talk about change, and that's going to be the critical discussion in, this, in, the, in our video today, is how is it that things are actually changing? That they're changing, we know that. We already know that. The question is, what initiates, what causes this change? Or to put in a more metaphysical vernacular, what are the principles that enable the fluctuation of change among substances that we seem to recognize? This will be very important because consider something that's also really important is, I as a person am a being, I too am a substance, but notice that my substance is changing over time, right? So as a child, I look one way. As an adult, I look another. Even from video to video, you've seen my beard grow and get shaved and my haircuts and all that sort of stuff. You're seeing me change. So if I am one substance, one being, how can we make sense of that? How can we make sense of the idea that I seem to be a different being with different parts at different times? So what unifies the my, the qual what is the uni unity and quality of my imminence as a being? I, I hope that makes sense. This is quite abstract, right? So let me sort of go through this, and let me I've and you'll see today I don't have my um, my uh, handwritten note thing, so I'm using Prezi again. So we're going to be so just sort of sort of view here. We're starting with perceptible substances. The substance is the subject matter. And here he's going to, it's important. In fact, let me jump back to the text here. Uh, 
right? Section two of book eight begins, the subject, the substance that is subject and matter is agreed. This is the substance that is something potentially. It remains then to describe the substance of perceptible things that is actuality, right? So what we have, we understand here the idea that matter is something that has potential. But the question is, what does it mean for something to exist as it exists, right? That is, what does it mean for something to be actualized or to be actual? Now, this word, the subject, this is sort of an interesting point, is that Aristotle earlier in the text, I believe it was at 1028b36, Aristotle defines a subject as that of which the other things are said, but not that, but not in turn said of any other thing, right? There's a double negation there, my mistake, right? So what is he talking about here? He's saying that the subject, ultimately, a subject of something is is what is everything is explained, but it itself doesn't explain the parts. And this goes back to the whole parts problem, right? Is what we're not trying to say is that a substance is some is just a combination of a bunch of parts, and that's all it is, right? In this, in the way that it, an, an an engine in a car has specific parts that work together in a certain way, right? Their character is one of addition, right? They're added to each other. Here, right, when we're talking about being, we're looking at the question of um, what is substance, not just in terms of its parts, but but in terms of the subject will be that which the parts explain, but the the subject itself doesn't explain the parts, right? You don't say um, something of you don't you don't predicate the subject to the parts because the parts are what explain by predication the subject, okay? So this is sort of important. Now, he then jumps in here and he begins to take a look at Democritus. Take a look here. He says, Democritus would seem to think that there are three differentia. In his view, the body, that is the subject, the matter is one and the same, and the perceptible things differ either by balance, figuring, or turning, or position, and arrangement. But he says, it's evident, however, that there are many differentia. So wait, what's he talking about there? Recall that Democritus... He's an atomist, and this is important for us since we are atomists primarily, um, right? The, the idea was that there are three primary differences here between the various atoms. On the one hand, right, there's the body, right? So they actually have some sort of extension in space, right? Um, right, that's the matter. It's one and the same. Um, um, well, remember, let me go back here or revise, right? For Democritus, we have different atoms, and the atoms are different. They can't be divided, but they're different sizes, and they combine in different ways, right? And so it's the relationship, it's the quality, and it's the body of the atoms that, can, that Democritus uses to solve this problem of the one and the many. But Aristotle here is suggesting that, well, wait a second. What exactly is Democritus doing? Democritus is using um, our three ways in which we can differentiate things in order to construct this atomistic system. But Aristotle is suggesting that there are other ways in which we can differentiate things. We can talk about things being combined or glued, for instance. They can be bended, for instance. They can be nailed, any one of these. They can have specific position. Um, right? They can exist in a specific time, in a specific place, having, they can have different attributes and so on and so forth. And of course, right here, the first thing hopefully you're thinking about is Aristotle's 10 categories of being, in which Aristotle tries to describe really the 10 primary ways in which we differentiate beings, right? Um, so the 10 categories of being here is really on the, should be on the back burner as you're reading this. Right, but he says clearly. Then is is also said in just as many ways. Right, whenever we talk about being anything having existence, we can talk about it having existence in a whole bunch of different ways. Right, and it seems like and he mentions for that something is a threshold, and I like this idea. We can think here about the idea um, substances and thresholds. Right, um, 
and because a threshold is a way of defining the difference between two things in which and what that means is it's a way of demarcating the being among two different things right we articulate limits to certain conceptions of being right so for instance um you can see here that as a dictionary right now here i'm not just talking about about the book in terms of its perceptibility but well i guess i should stick with that since that's what aristotle talks about right uh, but think this is a this is a uh, this substance is a dictionary when i define it as a dictionary i'm creating a threshold i'm creating a limit which allows you to demarcate it say from this book right this book by freud a dictionary is like a lexicon right um, and that is a that signifies a specific threshold which differentiates it from other beings but this threshold is also imminently perceived right it's how i can differentiate there being one book on top of the other for instance right um, so this is sort of very interesting actually um, and what he's arguing here is that we talk about being by making these limiting um, demarcations these threshold cases if you will at least and by the way this is my interpretation so um you know so uh, critique it as you will right but we use these thresholds in order to demarcate being now he says guess what there's so many thresholds just going to a system like democritus has and saying that there's three primary differentia or going to any other system which simply tries to articulate the primary ones and then solve the problem in that way is not going to work um, because what we need to do is we need to understand what is going to be universal to all of these threshold cases universally right he says he says a little bit there we must grasp then what kinds of differentia there are since they will be the principles of the things being what it is right so that's another important the threshold the limit signifies the principle our task is to articulate the principles right so it's evident that what's been said then he says that if substance is, if substance is the cause of a things being we should seek the cause of the being of each of these things in these differentia right and here he's also linking up his categories of being. So I'm hoping you'll get the sense here of the orga, the organon, the systematicity of the development of his philosophical theory here. We're going to see it gets him in trouble, though, um, especially when he gets to his cosmology a little bit later. Right. Um, here, let me move my page here. Right. Um, one thing that's important here that... I didn't make note of, but I do think is actually quite important to us, and I think actually gets to the heart of a potential criticism regarding Aristotle, um, is the notion here that, let's see where it is, I'm looking for it here, ah, there it is, he says this, he says, although none of them is substance even when combined with matter, right, he's talking about the, the thresholds, right, uh, the, the principles, that is, right, so the principle isn't the substance, right he says still it is in each case analogous to substance and just as in substance is what is predicated matter is the actuality itself now i don't really want to go into the discussion but i want to draw your attention here to this notion of analogous and here i think it's quite important because i think aristotle ultimately his his system here is depending upon specific arguments of analogy um, and i think that may get him in trouble um, because we'll have to be he'll need to be consistent here in terms of knowing what the limits of of analogical forms of reasoning are so that's the sort of critical point that i thought worth mentioning now let's sort of move here to the next sort of page here right now and this begins with this question what exactly does it mean for something to be actual what is actuality you'll notice here i put down that a threshold account of actuality is multifarious so let's jump back into the text here he says it's evident from what we've said then that if substance is the cause of a thing's being we should seek the cause of the being of each things in these differentia right and a little bit later it is evident from these uh as evident from this that each different sort of matter has a different actuality and account right so the way in which we 
describe a specific organization of atoms and molecules seems to be different based upon the different substances, right? Um, and the actuality of it seems to be different, right? So when I say that this is actual versus this object, both of these beings are made up of the same stuff, the, per the elements in the periodic table, right? Um, but to say that they're actual is to signify uh, a specific type of account, and it's going to be a different account for all of these different substances. For in some cases, the actuality is the composition. In some cases, it's a mixture. In other case, and it's in it's um, and in others, one of these other things will will be mentioned. We've mentioned for the account giving the differentia would seem to be the account of the form and the actuality. And this is a sort of kind of um, if you read fiction, this is sort of um, a foreshadowing here because we're going to see that his argument is going to be that form reveals the actuality whereas matter is linked up categorically with potentiality so we'll get to that here in just a couple moments right um, so we can say this is that some definitions let me go back here to jump here right so some threshold accounts are only true potentially this is a big clue for Aristotle in this passage right um, Right, so for instance, when I say, um, right, when I say quiet in a large expanse of air, air is the matter and quiet is the actuality of the substance. Well, and here you can see he's, that's where I was mentioning, he's linking up this notion of potentiality and actuality. But in some cases, when we signify a specific limit, what separates two things, we're actually talking about what can potentially be the case, right? Um, so, for instance, um, you can imagine, for instance, the way in which we might, um, the way in which we might understand how a being is coming to be, for instance. Like, imagine, for instance, if I say, um, um, okay, like, think about this. Imagine you meet a woman who's pregnant, and she's clearly pregnant, so you're not rude, right, when you say something about it. And you say, oh, wow, it's wonderful that you are that you are going to be a mother, right? In that case, the motherhood, if depending on how you define motherhood, and I don't want to get into debate about that, but let's say motherhood requires actually giving birth to a child somehow, right? But when I say, congratulations on becoming a mother, in this case, I'm signifying her as a substance in terms of a specific dimension of potentiality, in terms of what she will be. Um, right, and so you can see here that some of our definitions, some of the ways in which being gets signified, are signified in terms of potentiality, and some of them in terms of actuality. Now Aristotle then sort of jumps back to the question of a definition here, right? Um, and here he says a definition is an whoa, sorry, sorry about that. He says a definition is an account that is one, not by being tied together like the Iliad but by being of one thing, right? And here, think of the Iliad. The Iliad is a collection of stories that are sort of put together, right? And so they have a certain type of unity, but here he's saying that a, to define something is different than that, right? To define something is ultimately to define one thing. It's to define a unity in terms of being a unity, right? Um, so that's really going to be important here because our goal is to, to get to the definition of a substance, um, to get to the unity of what makes a substance whatever it is. Because remember, our thresholds are so multifarious here that we need a way of honing in on the definition of substance. He goes on, now it's evident that it is impossible to explain and solve this puzzle if one continues to define and to speak as they normally do. Now, there's that term puzzle, that in Greek, that's aporia. So it's impossible to unravel this problem if we continue to use the ordinary language we're used to. Now, this is sort of an important point, and one worth mentioning, because I think there's a, a number of modern philosophers, primarily those who fall under the heading of Wittgensteinians, for instance, um, of, of saying that, wait a second here, now Aristotle is arguing that we've reached a limit in our language, and that means we're going to have to go beyond our language. Um, and a lot of modern philosophers are very concerned about this and would argue that you can't do that, right? 
uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, that's why I mentioned Wittgenstein, he has this famous phrase where he says, listen, philosophy and philosophical problems occur when language goes on holiday, right? When the ordinary rules of our language get uh, sort of the tether that binds them to the world is cut and they sort of float up into the heavens, right? Language goes on holiday and metaphysics begins. Now, this is a criticism of philosophy by Wittgenstein, but you can see here that Aristotle is doing precisely this. Why? He's doing it because our language is clearly insufficient here. We can't just define substance the way we normally would. We have to go beyond our ordinary way of talking. And then he says this, um, but, and by the way, this is really kind of core passage of the, of the text, but if, as we say, one thing is matter and another is form, the one is something potentially, and the other actually, then what we're searching for no longer seems to be a puzzle. So at this point, Aristotle suggests that he solved the puzzle, which is namely this, that once we begin to realize that when we talk about matter, we're talking about potentiality, and once we talk, realize we're when we're talking about form, we're talking about actuality, suddenly the whole problem of how to define the parts in the whole and to define something as a unity suddenly sort of dissipates. And he gives this example, and it's sort of a bizarre and admittedly, I think, in a difficult example, um, or at least one that reads fairly odd. He says, for this puzzle is the same as the question of whether the round bronze is the formula of cloak. So imagine we have a word cloak. And let's imagine uh, that we define this word cloak in terms of, let me move forward here. Uh, here we are. Imagine we define this term cloak in terms of, in terms formulaically, in terms of round bronze. Now, we're not actually saying that cloaks are made of round bronze. What we're saying is, let's just imagine, what if we defined a being? What if we set the threshold for the being cloak, the substance of cloak, with um, the definition round bronze? Now, bronze signifies a certain type of material. It can be any type of thing, right? You can cast bronze in whatever shape you want, right? So bronze as a material signifies um, the potentiality for this term cloak, right? And round, right? Round not only um, demarcates the shape, but more importantly that it would demarcate what would what would allow us to count a cloak as actually being real, as actually being actual, right? That is, a cloak here would be any time we saw this material, bronze, really constructed into this roundness, into a sphere, for instance, right? And the idea here is that bronze by itself is not going to meet our threshold. But once we introduce the form with the material, right, that is, we then can signify whether or not something is actual or not, right? So take this, this example, uh, to take it slightly away from this sort of bizarre example I think Aristotle gives, or this archaic example, let's say book, right? Let's say that, what if we make the word book, right? Let's say the word book has the formula of square pages, combined square pages, right? Now, here, I guess that you can see here why Aristotle used the round bronze example, because then I got to say, well, what are pages made of? They're made of wood and all this sort of stuff, right? But let's say, let's say um, that if that's the case, right, the material of the book signifies what it has to be made of in the formula, but the form, that is the shapes, that is what enables me to recognize that this really is an actual book. It's not simply a potential book as it were. So what he wants to argue here is once we see this, we say that, listen, our, the way in which we're able to understand a being in terms of its actuality consists in recognizing the form of, a, of uh, some sort of matter, right? So we end up with this, is that being is composed of potentiality and actuality. Now this is very important and it raises an interesting question that I'm not going to try to answer. I'll just ask you which is namely that form is actuality, but here this is maybe one of the consequences of what happens when our language goes on a holiday. Matter is potentiality, that's the, the categorical alignment that Aristotle makes here, but wait a second, his metaphysics would imply that potentiality is something that exists, right? 
in a certain way. But if it exists in a certain way, it has to be actualized, actuality. So there's a question here about how, what exactly is potentiality? Is potentiality here a nominal category we use to describe things? Or is potentiality refer to something that's inherent in the nature of things? From my reading of Aristotle, he would suggest the latter. Uh, but I'm, I personally am not quite clear on how that can be the case. Uh, of course, this has been discussed by others, um, notably um, other scholars who are far more adept at understanding Aristotle than I. But what is potentiality? Because potentiality can't ever exist because it's only potential, but it can't not exist either. Um, so it's this interesting sort of puzzle here that I think that Aristotle has. Um, okay. Let, let me sort of signify these two passages and then we'll move on to his discussion of the unmoved mover. He says, the reason that they say these things is that they are searching for an account that makes potential and actuality one, and in doing so, they're searching for differentia, right? And he's, and he's, this is where he's mentioning other philosophers who have looked at these issues, and he's basically arguing that, listen, what all of these different philosophers have been doing is they've been trying to figure out a way that potential and actuality can become one. Think about it here. The uh, think about um, the problem of the one and the many, right? So how is it when something? No, not the problem. Of the one. Think about how when something changes, when something goes from existence to non-existence, as we defined at the beginning of the course. The question is, how is that transition possible? And what he wants to argue here is that well, it's not that things go in and out of existence. It's quite rather that what is potential and actual somehow become one over time. There's a fluidity, a flu, yeah, flu, uh, a fluidity, or there's a dynamic nature to this relationship between potentia and actuality, right? He says, in fact, it was, as we've said, the ultimate matter and form are one and the same, right? It's a logical distinction. The matter is something potentially, and the form, that thing, actually. Hence, to search for what causes them to be one is like searching for the cause of one and of being one, right? And here he's arguing that we have to also keep in mind that this relationship between matter and form, actuality and potentiality, right? This is a logical distinction. What makes them one is a misplaced question. They already are one, right? Um, oops. So, so that's sort of a, an important element here. Okay, let's move here to the unmoved mover. Um, Oops, I sort of scanned ahead. And this is where we jump actually ahead, and there's a lot more that Aristotle discusses in his metaphysics. We're jumping ahead to book uh, 12. And here we see that he begins to discuss what we call the unmoved mover. And uh, since we have it, since we're jumping ahead to book 12 here, um, I may have to do a little bit of background reading, but I'll background commentary, but I'll try to keep with the text as closely as I can, right? Um, and essentially, what he's going to argue here, let me skip ahead on this little thing, is the unmoved mover. The question, though, is, okay, so if we have this potential and actuality business, right, and let me give an example. Let's say that I want to pick up the coffee cup that's sitting on my desk right there, right? At this moment, my hand could only potentially pick it up. But at some point, and I'm demonstrating for you, for, for it for you now, I've now actualized that potential. And so in cases where we're talking about people actualizing potential, that's not hard for us to understand because you have someone who's trying to do something. They have an end towards which they're aiming, right? Um, in their, I want to pick it up, so I instrumentally use my hand and actualize that potential. But here's a question, though, is what, about, what in nature initiates motion? What is making all of this stuff move? And here we should ask, for instance, how does it all begin? right? These really are perennial questions, right? What initiates motion? Right, he says, well, since we found that there are three types of substances, and uh, we're going to skip ahead because we didn't, we didn't look at them in this text, two of, the, uh, two of the natural and one unmoved. The unmoved will be very important here, right? Um, we must discuss this third kind to show that there is an everlasting unmoved substance. For substances are the primary beings, and if all substances are perishable, 
then everything is perishable. Okay, so let's stop right there. These are the primary substances, all the little imminent beings and substances that are around me and around you. Those are what's primary. That's what we investigate. Those have legitimate, imminent actuality and reality, right? Um, but the question here is, is there so, is it all of these things are changing, which means they're all perishing. They're going in and out of existence. So if they're going in and out of existence, then that means everything is perishable. If everything is perishable, then no one substance can be responsible for change, right? You need something that isn't changing to be responsible for that which is changing, right? He says, but motion cannot come to be or perish since it's always been nor can time, since there cannot be a before and an after if there is no time, right? So motion is also continuous. So think about it for a moment here. Um, motion doesn't come in and out of existence in a certain way, right? Because motion just is, right? So things when they go in and out of existence, when they perish or come to be, this state of becoming, right? When this happens, the motion itself only seems to exist actually, right? It doesn't exist potentially, the motion itself. The substances, yes, but not the motion. And time as well. And it's also continuous, right? Notice that everything is changing. You may ask yourself, or maybe you've never asked yourself, why isn't that, why doesn't it just happen that everything just stops, right? Why does everything keep moving and keep perishing and changing, right? It seems totally continuous. But if it's continuous, then that means there has to be something that's always in continuous motion. And here he says specifically, think about circular motion. And he, Aristotle, is specifically thinking about the rotation of the planets. Now, remember, in Aristotle's cosmology, he thinks that the planets are revolving around the Earth. So we know that's not true today. But you can think here about motion that doesn't stop. And you can think about the idea that there seems to be motion in the universe that doesn't stop as well. Right. I mean, he's thinking about, but he in particular is thinking about circular motion. And this becomes a problem for him eventually, because that means his metaphysics, his, the arguments in his metaphysics in this book get linked up with his false cosmology, which raises for us a number of interpretive and hermeneutic questions. Namely, how can we understand this apart from his cosmology and still make sense of it? Um, or can we, right? That's the big question here. Does modern physics in, ultimately invalidate Aristotle's metaphysics, right? And by the way, that's a question that's been raging since the Renaissance, and you'll see that many people answer yes. Um, um, okay, so let's keep going here. Um, he says, it's no, it will be of no use to us then to assume everlasting substances as believers in the forms do, unless they include some principle capable of initiating change. Now, if you go back, if you want, and watch the video on Plato, and you'll see that Plato had a divided line, right? Become Being and becoming. All of the things that exist in the realm of becoming, that exist in the perceptible experience, are actually participating with these I, um, uh in these eternal uh, ideal forms, right? But the question of how those are related is never answered. And the question of what initiates change in the first place is never answered, right? And because of the reasons we looked at in terms of uh, the third man argument and so forth, the, the theory of the forms here doesn't work. And you see here, um, Aristotle has directly mentioned the idea that what we need is a principle whose essence is actuality. So let's keep reading here. He says, and even this or some other type of substance besides the forms isn't sufficient, right? That is, notice we can't define perishable substances in view of some other perishable substance, right? For if it does not actualize this potentiality, there will be no motion. And yet, is it sufficient if it actualizes its potentiality, but its essence is potentiality, right? For there will be no everlasting motion, since what has potentiality need not actualize it. Now here remember that simply because something has potentiality doesn't mean it will get actualized, right? I have the potential to become the President of the United States. Well, you probably don't think that, but maybe, right? 
Um, that's not going to get actualized, right? Unless something really radical changes in my life and in the country. Um, neither of that's going to happen, right? So you can see here that not every potential gets actualized. So we can't point to a substance that's made of potentiality in order to answer the question of actuality. It doesn't make any sense because you have to start with actuality. Something can't come from nothing, which means that whatever is potential must be derived in principle by something that's fully actual, something that's fully existent and real. But not only is it existent and real, it can't be made of matter, right? Because remember we said that matter is potentiality. So that means we're talking about something that's fully actual is actually immaterial in this specific technical sense, right? He says there must then be a principle of the sort whose essence is actuality. And I'm just going to highlight that right now. That is totally critical to the entire discussion, right? Um, so Plato, for instance, believed in everlasting actuality, um, for they say that there is always motion, right? Because becoming just always exists, and so does being, right? But the initiation never works, right? For Because nothing is moved at random, but in every case there must be some cause. Now remember, we're talking about principles and causes in metaphysics. So the question is, what's causing this motion? And more importantly, what sort of motion is primary, right? Um, for that makes an enormous difference, right? Nor can Plato say that the principle is of the sort that he thinks it is, what initiates its motion, for he also says that the soul is later than the motion and comes into being at the same time as the universe, right? And you, here he's making a reference particularly to Plato's sort of cosmological view, and he, and he says, listen, it just doesn't work. We have to know what's primary, and it can't be based on the soul which comes before and all this. We have to understand the primary cause of motion in its imminent sense, right? In terms of its thisness, right? Um, and here is where he's going to sort of jump in. And he's really thinking about the stars and the heavens here, right? He says, but the same things have always existed, either in a cycle or in some other way, if actuality is prior to potentiality. Okay, so if actuality is logically prior to potentiality, and that's the question he's looking at here. Let me sort of jump over here, right? Um, he's going to say that actually must be logically prior because here's what. If, whoops, sorry about that. Because um, if potentiality were logically prior, then there should be nothing, right? Because what would initiate the state? Nothing. Right, because a potential is only initiated by something that's already actual, right? Um, so, right, think about my parents, right? So before I was born, I I was only a potentiality, right, in my parents' substance, right? Then my parents had me, right, um, and I was born, and then set right. And then suddenly I was actualized. So in that case, the whatever it is that I am, this potential only gets actualized by something that already is actual. But if actuality on the larger picture here is logically prior, then that means that, that something like what exists now has always existed, right? It has to be cyclical. So Aristotle here has a cyclical view of the universe, is the idea that ma the material universe is cyclical in some sense. And he's also, of course, looking up at the stars in, in astronomy and saying, look at the heavens. They are cyclical and they are eternal. Now, today we know that neither of those things are true, but that's not what Aristotle thinks. So he sees this as an exemplar of his idea here, right? But he says that, so, and think about something that's cyclical, it, right? Has a starting point and then its ending point is where its starting point is. And so it continues around and around. And so the question here is, what can cause that? It has to be something that's actual to initiate it. And what we might say is it, it can't, like we said earlier, it can't be something that's moved itself because it's fully actual and it's not potential. So it's non-material. It's only formal, right? Um, whatever this thing is, we can call it the first mover because it's what begins this process. And he's not just talking about the stars at this point, but all things, right? There is a first mover. And the first mover will cause the motion of the other movements, the second, the third motion, right? 
So he argues that the first mover begins a whole chain of reaction of motions, um, but that the first mover is the only thing that's fully um, actual and logically prior, right? Now, this is where, to a certain extent, um, I sort of have a problem with Aristotle, right? He says, there is something then that is always being moved in a ceaseless motion, and this motion is circular, and so the first heaven is everlasting. Hence, there is also something that initiates motion, and since whatever both is moved and initiates motion is um, intermediary, there is something that initiates motion without being moved, something that is everlasting, and a substance and actuality, right? So, uh, actually, no, I don't have a problem with any of that. Um, but that's sort of the core uh, way in which he lays it out. Where I have a problem here is when he begin when Aristotle begins to link his cosmology to the stars. Um, at this point, I can understand why he does this because he wants to say that the circular movement of the stars is initiated by um, the first mover and all of this. And I think metaphysically, this all works and it works by analogy. But the problem, I think, is that Aristotle doesn't want it to just work by analogy. I think that he wants his cosmology, that is his astronomical observations, to completely be to coincide with his theory of the of the unmoved mover. And I think that's where things begin to break down. And this is important because remember Aristotle believes that we're the center of the universe and everything is revolving around us like a circle. In fact, I have sort of have a thing to show you here. Here's what it looks like, right? So in his view, here's the earth and here's the ether. And then here's all the different stars and the sun. And there's these spherical, it's like a Russian box spheres upon spheres. And his argument here is that the unmoved mover gets the first sphere going that's eternal, and then they slowly begin to work their way out. In fact, he goes on as to say that each one of these stars, uh, or planets, has, uh, yeah, planets, they're not stars, but each one of these, right, have their own movers, right? And so there could be a chain reaction of mo movers as well, right? And to me, this is problematic as a person who's, who's you know, educated in modern physics. We can't accept this view of the universe any longer. It's simply not credible, right? But there are some interesting things here, and I'm not trying to save Aristotle from modern, modern physics here, um, because ultimately, I think his metaphysical theory is separate, and I think his arguments are strong. I think there's something like what he's arguing seems to have to be the case in some way, unless we're just to give up and be to and give up to certain skeptical conclusions. But does it have to be linked up? Could we revise Aristotle's cosmology here? I think maybe, right? Think about gravity, for instance. Gravity is something that causes motion, right? It is something that's immaterial, right? It's not matter. But it's certainly something that's totally actual, right? It is real. And it is a principle and a cause of things. Think about how um, uh, an, uh, a physicist, a theoretical physicist, will use gravity as a way to calculate and understand causal relationships over time, right? Think of how a theoretical physicist does that. Gravity functions as something like a first principle. And remember how we even said that first principles are non-demonstrable? Now consider the fact that in theoretical physics, gravity is not something that we really know anything about, right? Um, and, and I should mention here that I am not trained in theoretical physics, physics, so if you're a theoretical physicist watching this, you probably have a better understanding than I do. Feel free to post that, um, you know. But as far as I understand it, we do we use grav we have a way of understanding gravity descriptively but what gravity is itself remains quite mysterious to us we treat it as a principle to construct our physics um, and i know there's physicists out there who are trying to decode this so um so there's interesting stuff here so um so that's one of the issues i have and you'll see it come up a little bit later here we're almost done one thing that's interesting here is he then may, sort of links it back up to his conception of what we're doing as philosophers. He says, understanding is moved by its object, right? And the first column of opposites is what is understood in its own right. In this column, substance is primary. The primary substance is the substance that is simple and actually operating, right? Further, what is fine and what is choice worthy for itself are in the same column, and what is primary is in every case either the best or what is analogous to the best.
right? Division shows that what something is for is among the things that are unmoved, right? So here, something that's unmoved uh, uh, is includes what something is for, the goal towards which something is, right? And what is understanding? Understanding is our attempt to not only know things, but to become one in a certain way with the object. So if I want to understand the Greek language, for instance, the way I gain understanding is when I, my, um, my intellect, my reason becomes one with the object. When I actually am thinking in Greek, that's when I can understand, say I understand knowledge, right? Uh, that's that's when I say I have understanding, right? So the end, though, let me go back here. For it is either the end for some beneficiary or the end aimed at in some process. The first of these have moved and the second is unmoved. The end initiates motion by being an object of love and it initiates motion in other things by being something else that's being moved. Now remember, Aristotle argues much, much earlier that all men, all humans by nature desire to know. We naturally seek understanding. And he thinks that understanding is achieved when we become one with our object, when our understanding becomes one with it in a certain way. And there's interesting questions there about that, right? And that end is ingrained in us. It is in a certain un, something that's unmoved. It's not something that's created. It just is there. It is a principle, right? And these principles are sort of unmoved. Um, and so the idea here is that um, the understanding ultimately philosophy, the understanding the philosophy seeks is to understand this first principle. That is to become one in a certain way with the object, in this case, the unmoved mover. And Aristotle later is going to say that what this means then is that philosophy and the understanding has within it a certain form of divinity. There's something divine about it. Um, Let's see here. Actually, let me go down here, right? Understanding in its own right is of what is best in its own right. And the highest degree of understanding is what is best to the highest degree in its own right. And understanding understands itself by sharing the character of the object of understanding. For it becomes an object of understanding by being in contact with and by understanding its object. So that the understanding, whoops, so that the understanding and its object are the same. So that's sort of what I was referring to there. That's where he mentions it. And then he says, If then the God is always in the state that we are in sometimes, that deserves wonder. Right? And here's what he's saying, right? Because remember, for us as humans, we're, we have the potential of understanding. We're trying to actualize it. And here he's suggesting that the unmoved mover in, the, in view of it being pure actuality, is always one with itself, which means that that sort of glorious state that we can achieve in philosophy, and I don't know if you've achieved it, but every once in a while in philosophy, there's these moments. Sometimes people say it's when the light bulb goes off, but these moments when suddenly every the landscape opens up and we have understanding about something, right? And it's this great, it feels good to gain understanding. And he says that the, the, this is what the unmoved mover, if we were going to say that there was a feeling that the unmoved mover had, this is what it must be like, right? Um, and that this is something that's, and it's, and to gain understanding is to gain knowledge of what's everlasting and unmoved, right? Uh, ultimately, in terms of his metaphysics here. Okay. Um, the next page here in this section is when he begins to sort of do his cosmology. And this is what I was mentioning earlier, right? Um, he says, there are also everlasting local motions of the planets for a body that moves in a circle as an everlasting unceasing motion, right? This isn't actually quite true, um, but this is where he's linking in his cosmology. Uh, and he, right, you can see, for instance, he even says, it's evident then that there are substances and that one of them is first and another second in an order corresponding to the motion of the stars, right? So he sort of even creates, if you will, a great chain of motions or something like this. Um, one thing that is important that I'll mention here is, and this is where Aristotle sort of gives himself a, a, a release, emergency release valve. He says, but this provisional answer, he realized there's something provisional about what he's talking about here. We must on some points, 
in, inquire ourselves and on other points find out from other people's inquiries. So he's not saying that this is the final word. And that's why I think there is a potential way to try to see if we can link up what we know in modern physics today with what Aristotle is discussing. Because Aristotle would be open to that idea. He says, if something different from what is now said appears correct to later students, that's us. Something different appears, right? There's a different thing for us, right? We must be friends to both sides, but must follow the more exact investigators. So at the end of the day, Aristotle is concerned with what is exact. And he thinks that's what should guide our development here. Remember, to talk about what is, one thing we should mention for Aristotle, to talk about something in terms of it being exact is ultimately to articulate the essence of something. Right, So whatever answer we can give that's most essentially correct is what we should agree with. So Aristotle is open to the idea that we can be wrong. Um, and of course, in this sort of next passage, I'm going to move down here. I'm, I'm going to skip this. Um, down here. There is this sort of two more points here and we'll be done. He says, there is a tradition handed down from the distant past to later generations that these stars are gods and that the whole of nature is divine, right? Um, he says, the rest of tradition is mythical, a creation um, added to persuade the many to and to use and upholding what is lawful and advantageous. So right here he's saying, listen, the ancient view that the stars represented something divine, he says, Ultimately, yeah, that idea, there's something right about that idea. And it's right insofar as it signifies there has to be some sort of principle of motion. And there can be a multitude of principles that are working in concert with each other, which, of course, goes along with his cosmology and the unmoved mover that he's given us here. Right. But right. Um, he's sort of also saying that, you know, but all of the Greek religion is all has been created really for political reasons, right? But he says that if we separate the first point, that they thought the primary substances were God, and we separate this from all this other stuff that comes later, right? Um, right, or the, these uh, creations, um, and consider it alone, we will regard it as a divine insight, right? So one of the things that that is great about Aristotle is he demonstrates what it means to be a good philosopher and he demonstrates what we call the principle of charity. On the one hand, we should be critical of the past, but on the other hand, we should recognize how and where they were right um, and be charitable to understand them, right? Um, so let's see here. I'm going to end here. I'm going to jump down here to the very end of our passage and I want to sort of mention this, right? Well, I'll mention two things here, right? So what is divine understanding? He says the divine understanding then must be understood itself so that its understanding is an understanding of understanding, right? The idea here is, remember, as human beings, we understand things when we go from potential to actualizing um, the mind's ability to grasp the object, right? Um the divine understanding is always actual, which means it's pure understanding. And so that means divine understanding is the understanding of understanding itself, right? So why is this important? Because philosophy is seeking that ultimately, right? And he says, but wait a second, is the object of understanding composite, right? If it were composite, understanding would change and understanding different parts of the whole. Perhaps we should say that Whatever has no matter is indivisible, and on this view, the condition of actual understanding is the condition that human understanding, or rather the understanding of any composite beings, reaches over a certain length of time. For it doesn't possess the good at this or that time, but achieves the best, which is something other than it, in some whole period of time. And this is the condition of understanding that understands itself, is in throughout all time right so what's he saying he's saying as far as the way i interpret it is that it what i almost will call is that this is the it's almost like a dialectical process the under that over time we're we're gaining the understanding of understanding and that's why for instance we be we keep coming up with these provisional insights that we then have to sort of say well that's not quite true and and what plato called the dialectical conversation 
between Socrates and his interlocutors. We sort of go back and forth. What does this mean? This is embodying the type of understanding that Aristotle links with the understanding of understanding, or the divine. Um, and there's a question here about whether or not we should understand Aristotle's metaphysics as ultimately gesturing towards a theological conception, or whether or not this is a purely sort of naturalistic, mechanical explanation of the universe. Um, I personally tend to interpret it in the secular sense, but I think that Aristotle himself was doing a theology. So I think that we can gain value in a secular, we can gain value out of Aristotle's metaphysics by understanding its secular import um, rather than its theological. But I think Aristotle ultimately is doing a theology at the end of the day. I mentioned this before, there's a great book by Owen on this topic. So that's where we're going to conclude our metaphysics. And we can simply say that the unmoved mover is the final principle for the cause that initiates chain within the universe. That is, the unmoved mover is the final answer, right? And I'm going to make that my final answer. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope this is somewhat helpful. I'll see you guys online. Thanks a lot.